Something I said this morning. We are vessels, okay? And every person that walks in, you're carrying something with you. If you're bringing depression or joy or faith, some people walk into this room, they bring sadness. Some people bring a celebration. But the collective spirit that you sense in the house is what happens when the majority come in. And if they all bring a joy, then there's joy in the house of the Lord. In other words, God in your heart, whatever you allow to accumulate in your heart, whenever you attend a meeting like this, you bring something. That when all the people come into the house, bringing a little bit of joy, collectively we get immersed in that joy. And can you imagine the joy of the Lord is our strength? How He just comes and says, wow, they really love me in this house. And how His presence shows up even more than you and I can contain as we each bring something with us. So whenever you walk into a city church service, any service, or in your office, in your home, bring life and joy to it. Wow, you missed it. Amen. Okay. okay. And so, is the person beside you joyful? Yeah. Uncontainably joyful. Like, ah. Uh. Okay. Last week... Uh, we talked about, we talked on the book of Malachi. Do you remember that? And in the book of Malachi, we said this was the last book of the Old Testament. My wife reminded me again, because I kept saying last book of the Bible. And it's always good to have a wife who corrects you lovingly. Okay. And that adverb is very important because it's not like, Malachi lagi. That, that, that doesn't work. It has to be Joe. Um, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Okay. And so respectfully done. And, then, yeah. and in the book of Malachi, we said, look, God was just venting his disappointment and hurt. How Israel, whom he loved and called, he said, I am your God, you are my people. He called them and adopted them as his own children. And then he blessed the children of Israel over all the other nations. It's amazing how starting from Abraham, we said this nation prospered to such greatness and glory and wealth that uh, the name of the Lord would, was glorified. But we also said that they weren't faithful to God. We saw how many times they would go back into idolatry. They would veer away from God's ways. They would actually become evil, and it depended very much on who was leading Israel at the time. Until it came to a point wherein there was no more remedy, the people's heart, hearts had hardened, they had gone away from the Lord, to the point that in the book of Malachi, uh, it starts out with the Lord. It was a Sunday, yeah? And the amazing thing is you came back. Because my wife was saying, wasn't that a little bit too heavy? What if they all get scared and run away? No, uh, we got mature people in the house. Yeah. And some people like sermons like that. Pastor ko sakit What a sadistic person. Huh? Loves pain. I'm, I'm not into painful messages, but sometimes you need that. Yeah, because God chastises those whom he loves. And with Malachi, what actually happened was God was saying, look, if... You honor your father, and if I'm your father, where's my honor? And then he complained even about how the offerings were sick and lame and weak and maimed. They brought the cripple, and God said, you won't even give that to your governor. If somebody came to your party and it was a guest of honor, you'd prepare the best that you could. But God was saying, you've taken this whole worship thing for granted in that you just offer this and that because it was now a wearisome thing to do church. And you and I need to be guarded that we never get tired of assembling ourselves together like this. Amen? Don't just, oh, I've got to go to church again. You know. And so this is where God said, you know, you've been treacherous, he said. You've been treacherous to me. You've been nice to me when you needed me. But then when you had all your needs, you ignored me. And it's almost like fallen human nature to reach out to God when we're in need. And then when we have abundance, we, we back off. And so 
as God lined up all the different things he wasn't happy with, I want you to picture an engaged man, groom, and his bride was not being faithful. And he said, even in tithes, you haven't been faithful. You haven't been faithful to the spouse of your youth. And he said, what is this about you? And it was a, a God who was hurt. Amazing that we can hurt God. And the reason why he can get hurt is because he loves. Amen. And then he ends off with saying, please draw near to me and I will draw near to you. You, re you return to me, he said, I will return to you. And he left the ball in the court of the people. And the last word of the Old Testament was the word curse. And then we said for 400 years, there was no visitation or move of God. Now that's, of course, about 10 generations wherein there's nothing about God. God didn't do any sign, any wonder, nothing in the skies, no prophets, uh, no angels. And so it left off with that heavy tone. And when you look now at your own life, have you ever had a period in your life where you just wake up and you're so alive in your spirit? Okay, you've also woken up so dead in your spirit, right? Yeah, okay. But have you ever woken up and it was just like, oh, I'm alive, bless the Lord, I can't wait to get up and, and live my day? Yeah? Have you ever praised God from the rising of the sun till the going down of the same, which is the sun? Yeah? Have you ever done that? And then have you also had periods wherein, wow, it's like weeks, you're pumped in the spirit. I mean, on the inside. It's not because you were promoted or she... It was because on the inside, you just had a touch of God. Ever had God just touch your life? Yeah? Okay. But then have you also had periods of dryness? Where it's just so quiet. And you open your Bible. And have, have you ever read a whole psalm and actually said, I didn't understand a single thing. You had to go back and try to read it again. And no matter how you tried, nothing would come. Ever been through that? Yeah. You ever been so dry, that, uh, so fired up that when you listen to a song and it says there are like a hundred billion failures disappear and it just grabs your heart and tears well up in your eyes and you just go, God, thank you that my sins are forgiven. Ever had periods like that? And then ever had a song that once moved you and then when you read it again, you, but, uh, it, it lost it. The song didn't change. The heart did. You ever been through periods like that and said, wow, this verse used to like pop from the page and hit me strong. But then later on you read the same verse and yeah, 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 I read that before, know that already. Ever been through that kind of stuff? Well, imagine going through 400 years of that. A nation dispersed for 400 years, no touch of God, just dryness throughout. Now you've been dry, and everybody ever been dry for a month? Excuse me. Have you ever sinned all month long? Yeah. You've been dry for a month. Yeah. And, and, and church is a heavy thing. And so this was a period of 400 years where God wasn't even touching his people. And it must have been so dry. And by this time uh, in the New Testament, when the New Testament comes into your story, I haven't started yet. Hang in there. When the New Testament comes into the story, Israel is now a province of the empire of Rome. All right, And because of that, they've now become such a religious people. They still had a temple, but it was all just fake, hypocritical stuff. And one thing City Church is so opposed to is a dry, fake, hypocritical, legalistic, judgmental church. We like church alive. We like the people real. We don't like sitting next to somebody who's like a statue. That when you all stand up and, and they stand up, you actually, oh, we want to make sure that you know the one beside you is full of life. Amen. Such that when you walk in this place, I want to make sure when everybody walks out, you're two inches taller than before you walked in. That's good news for all the short people. You walk in, it's a little bit heavy, but you walk out pumped on the inside. It's like, God just filled my heart. You ever felt like that? Yeah. And make sure you stay filled all week long. 
Don't let some rude driver in Cebu deflate you. Amen. And sometimes it's not even the rude driver. It's a waiter who serves your food last. You ever been so hungry and, and, and the Spirit of God just left you, you lustful person, you? You ever been so full of church and God? Who? And then, and then, dugay kayo mong order, gisapot ka. Have you met people when they're hungry, they're, they're mean? Don't marry that kind of person. Dangerous person. Amen. Sheila knows this. When I'm hungry, I just hibernate. I sleep. I just... Some people get headaches, stomach aches. They get irritable. Uh, I just sleep. And, and it's good that way. At least you don't bother anybody. Amen. And so 400 years of silence, and then all of a sudden, what happens now is angelic visitation takes place. I want you to see how this works in... Uh, and I want to read a psalm to you so that we don't get lost today. And it's a very common psalm, the most famous psalm. By the way, it's a silent P and a silent L. It's like S double A M. Psalm. Come on. <clears throat> don't say it like I said it. Psalm. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And I want you to hold that phrase. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me, shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's good news to read. And this is a passage that I, I want to pull out today and understand that the Lord is your shepherd. And I'm going to go verse by verse and expound that. You can find that online. There's full of lots of sermons on this. But why the rod and the staff, they comfort me. I want you to recognize, first of all, that David, who wrote the psalm, was one of the good people in your Bible. In the Old Testament, he had a heart after God's own heart. He wanted to build the temple for the Lord, but the Lord wouldn't allow him because he was a man. He was a warrior. He had shed blood. And so it was his son that built the temple. But David had that desire. He, he wrote Psalms, a man after God's own heart. Have you written any Psalms? Selah. 400 years of silence. That's what happened. And he's a man he, who expressed his heart towards the Lord. Of course, he had shortcomings as well, just like all of us, even more than us. He committed adultery, took a man's wife, and then murdered the man and lost the baby in the process as well. But the point I want to bring out today is in 400 years of silence prior to that was a life of people that ignored God most of the time, but there were sporadic leaders like David and Hezekiah and Uzziah and Josiah. And whenever you hear the word Yah in the last part of a person's name, it, it actually was translated God. And so as David writes his psalm, he's one of the bright shining lights of the Old Testament. Remember, there's a 400-year period of silence. And then you will see now in the New Testament, thank God for the New Testament, angels visit and one of the first angelic visitations was to a priest named Zacharias. Zacharias was married to Elizabeth. And they were an old couple. This priest had no baby, no child, no son. But an angel appeared to Zacharias. you got to realize, there haven't been angels appearing for 400 years. And as this angel appears, tells him that you're going to have a, a, a child... And he was saying, you know, I'm old, how can this be? And eventually Elizabeth, his wife, um, bore a son. And what, but while that son was in her womb, 
Elizabeth's cousin, which was, was Mary. Everybody knows Mary? Yeah. Mary gets a visitation as well. She also has an angel come to her and say, Thou art favored over all women. Okay. And, that, and she said, How can I be also pregnant? I've not known a man. And, and the angel said that that which is in her is conceived by the Word of God, the Spirit of God in her. And so as Mary visits um, Elizabeth before that part I just described you, the baby inside Elizabeth's womb's womb moves. And all you pregnant women know how that feels like. But here was John who was, the Bible said, filled with the Spirit while in his mother's womb. Can you imagine a baby full of the Holy Ghost already in his mother's womb. What a wild baby that would be, huh? Having his own little revival floating in his water bag, coming out, and instead of just crying like other babies, speaking in tongues. I was like, and here's John, who now becomes John the Baptist, not John a Baptist, okay? Because he was the one who goes out, he was going out, and his message later on would be repent. He was preparing the way in the wilderness. And aside from John, uh, excuse me, Elizabeth and Zacharias, as well as Mary having a visitation, Mary's husband-to-be, Joseph, also has a visitation. But every time the angel visited Joseph, it was in a dream. Do you know you have to be asleep to have a dream? Yeah, because if you're awake, it's called a daydream. Ever daydreamed? Serious. That, that's a daydream. Okay. That's a daydream. But a dream where it's, it's a subconscious thing. You're not acting upon it. The angel shows up and talks to Joseph several times. Don't be afraid to take this woman to be your wife. And Joseph, we said in the Bible, never said a word. There's no rec recorded word that Joseph said. Interesting. And all we had were angelic visitations in a dream. Therefore, Joseph slept a lot. Yeah? Because you don't get a dream till you're in REM. I mean, that means you're really in deep sleep. And so angels, an angel would visit and say, take this woman to be your wife. Don't be afraid. And so wouldn't you love to just have the Lord speak to you in a dream? I mean, you don't have to fast. You don't have to kneel. You don't have to play songs. You just, get, you just fall asleep. God's talking to you. Fantastic. It can happen. Are you Christians? Good. And so you got, you've got these angelic visitations, but what I want to bring to you is, is, is now that there are dreams coming forth, it means to say, and angels, God is now revisiting His people after 400 years. And then one strange night, there was a star and it would follow shepherds and wise men. It would converge where the wise men and the shepherds converged in a barn, in a stable. There was this star that was following them, wise men from the east. And we know that was a star sent by God. But the real star was the baby in the manger. Amen. And why is that beautiful? Because for 400 years of silence, now you have angelic visitations. But now even more than that, the Son of God Himself comes in the form of a man, in the fullness of His, His divinity, comes to visit us on the earth. And that's a wonderful revelation that in the, in the midst of 400 years of darkness, in your dryness, God can suddenly show up in your life. Amen. In other words, you don't have to wait for the next recharge. Question, have you ever been so dry? It's like the person beside you is like asking this valley of dry bones, can it live? That was a question. The question was, can this valley of dry bones live? And it was wonderful how the prophet replies, Lord, only you know. That's a safe answer, right? Lord, only you know, and of course God made the dry bones become alive again. And so God is able to take your dryness. Maybe you're in a spell right now of dryness. And we've had a long, hot summer. But today and last night, the rain started to come. There's a low-pressure area, and it's wonderful to have that rain. 
Some of us need that in the spirit. Amen. And so what were the messages in the gospel that started to come out? Matthew chapter 3, for example. If you read Matthew chapter 3, here's John the Baptist's message. He said, in those days, in verse 1, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 Jesus starts his ministry, and it says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we can go on and on, but we won't. But the New Testament Gospels are full of messages saying, Repent. And what is repent? To many people, it's, they think it's being sorry for your sins. They think it's like, I feel so guilty, I need to change. No, repent in its literal translation is actually make a U-turn and go the opposite direction. Why was this the message? 400 years away from God, no voice, no angelic visitation, no touch of God. They were walking in the direction of damnation. And the message that came was, guys, Turn around, you're going the wrong way. In fact, when Jesus came into your life, He turned your life around, didn't He? Amen? But the real turning had to be your choice. You had to actually say, I am such a vile sinner, I want to turn my life around. And it's one thing to repent of your sins, but you've got to continue and run towards God. You can't just say, I'm going to turn my life around. Okay, well, you turned around. You've got to start walking towards the Lord. And a lot of times, Israel would repent. They would turn around, but they would not seek a relationship with the Lord. And why is this important? Let me ask you a couple of questions. Before you leave today, this message is all about how you're walking. And can you please understand what happened in the Old Testament? Why they experienced God and yet did not continue in God, and what should we do so that we don't get dry again? By the time you leave this room, the purpose of this message is for you to say, okay, so that's how I don't dry up, as if we didn't, shouldn't already know already. In the Old Testament, there were a lot of miracles, just as the new. But the Old Testament has miracles that people describe today as biblical proportions. When they say biblical proportions, it's like massive scale miracles. The 10 plagues that would come upon Egypt were massive scale miracles. Can you imagine all the dust become mites? Everybody's just scratching. How would that have looked from God's perspective while he sat on the throne and all his enemies were itching away? Hmm. Personally, funny. Can you imagine you release something to your enemy's house and everyone in your enemy is just scratching themselves and you're watching that going... <laughs> I mean, all the frogs now come out of the River Nile and invade, infest the palace and all the homes. Can you imagine the River Nile turning into blood? Can you imagine all the different plagues that would come until Pharaoh turned his heart? And I want to tell you, I had a friend who was not much of a friend, he would always make fun of us years ago when this whole born-again thing came to the Philippines. And he was making fun of how, you know what, you born again, hallelujah, praise the Lord. He, he would make fun of us all the time. And, and I, I didn't like the person because he was just always mean and sarcastic towards our newfound faith. One day he came visiting. First he called and then he visited because he was scared like crazy. You know what happened to him? Just one night, he walked by the mirror and he looked at himself and behind him was a figure that was demonic. He turned around, there was nobody there. He looked there, it was still there. So he ran away. You know what? The person calls up the next, just a few minutes later. I thought he was still teasing me and joking me, making fun of me. And then he said, can I go see you? I need to see you right now. He came and he was really trembling. He didn't want to go back to his house because he said that he saw a demon in his house. It's amazing how God can scare you to run to him, huh? <laughs> Amen. 
Kamu mga pilosopo deha. God bless you sa inyong salamin. You know. And this guy was just freaked out. He was here mocking God and our faith and making fun of the Bible and our singing. And all of a sudden, there's this visitation that he didn't expect. It wasn't an angelic visitation. It was a demonic visitation. But either way, you run to God, don't you? Yeah, I don't think when an angel shows up in your bedroom, say, Hail, Mary. I mean, I don't think Mary would just say, what's up, dude? I mean, I think she would have freaked out. Anything that's out of the natural. Yes. And so here's now Israel, Egypt experiencing miracles, yet none of them would be able to say, you know what, there must be a God behind all of this thing. Not until the story when Israel escaped from Egypt, they're escaping through the Red Sea, Pharaoh chasing them with his army, and then the Red Sea closes in. Then all the armies that Israel faced heard of the story the children of Israel has a God on their side. You know when God is for you, who can be against you? Yeah. It was something about Israel now when they were marching through the desert. Their enemies would tremble because of the stories about God is on their side. And the mighty Egyptian army was consumed because God is on their side. Pretty unfair, huh? Hello? If you are one of the enemies of Israel, uh, that's cheating. Side. And that you would think that Israel have a faith so pumped that they saw the Red Sea. Now they knew it wasn't some magic wand that, that Moses was bringing. I mean, how can an old man with an old stick do such a thing? It was one thing to to the ground and make and turn it into that imitated that as well but how do you part the Red Sea with an old man's stick and as Moses raised his rod up like this it would part and the people of Israel would walk through you would think after the victory that they had and the Egyptian army destroyed you would think the next day they would be celebrating oh yes they were Miriam wrote a song she sang and she danced but then shortly after that, and this is the part that made me scratch my head, they began to grumble and murmur against the Lord. They said to Moses, why did you bring us out into the wilderness to die? What are we going to do? We can't eat. We can't drink. And what did God do? Another miracle. He provided manna. They didn't know what it was. And manna actually meant, what is it? Okay. You don't want to name your restaurant manna. It's like, what's some of There was flour from heaven that they could collect, and they would make cakes out of it. And it provided, it was provided for them 40 years. Can you imagine 40 years of provision? Every day was a miracle of provision. And then when they were thirsty, Moses struck the rock as instructed by God, and a river flows out of the rock. I don't mean weeping, seeping, I mean river. It wasn't a stream. It was a river that could quench the thirst of over two million people and their livestock. Miracle from God. And then eating manna for 40 days, 40 years. Boring, huh? Hello? What would you do if you, we said this in the church before, if you had 40 years of the same food? You don't come home and Ma, what's for dinner? I know, like, pangutana. Mana gihapun. It was breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, midnight snack, birthday party, food. Everything was manna. You have to get creative when manna is all you get. Manna chips, manna fries, manna flakes, manna salad, manna soup, stirred manna, stir fried manna, hey, manna pizza, mac manna, jolly manna, all kinds of manna for 40 years. You get creative with it. But you know what? You can take daily miracles for granted. And I think that has been the failure of Israel in the Old Testament. God would do miracles, and they would take the miracles for granted. The God who parted the Red Sea, don't you think he can provide for the people? And he did. And then when he provided for them, they complained that there was no meat. 
We're sick and tired uh, of this manna, they said. We miss the onions and the leeks and the garlic and the kangkong and alugbati. They wanted some vegetables. God sent them quail. It's a low-flying bird. And they ate so much quail, the Bible says it was coming out of their nostrils. Did you know that your mouth is connected to your nose? Yes. Try to drink soda that isn't cold. Hold it into your mouth. It'll, it'll come out of your nose. It was, ah. They ate so much, they gorged in the lust of meat, carnis, that it was coming out of their nostrils. And then they would fight an enemy. The Amalekites would come in and God would tell, for example, Joshua, you know, help Moses lift up the rod. Whenever Moses lifted up the rod, the enemy would be defeated. Whenever Moses dropped his rod, the enemy would start to win. So he had to keep his arm up all the time. But since he was an old man, you know, they had two people on the other side helping the leader up. It's good to have people help an old leader. I mean that more than one way. Okay. And so as you see these miracles, the question that I'm, I'm, I want to throw at you is, I, I wonder why, having seen so many miracles, their faith didn't rise to a point that they would stop complaining. I wonder why people actually say, oh, milagro, and then, and then they go back to be re religious again. I wonder why you can go to a recharge camp and be so full of God for about three weeks and get so quiveringly excited about the Lord, and then after that, just go back to an old life again. I wonder why the pattern of the people in the Old Testament was getting sporadic touches of God in their lives, but in between drying up. I wonder why people will come to church and get so filled, and then the following week come back and need another infilling. I wonder why it happens that the pattern in the Bible of humanity was always asking a touch of God and then going dry again. A touch of God is something God does. But in between the touches of God, you and I really have a role. And if we're not doing our part, that's why we dry up and say, oh God, touch us again. I pray live louder it will be such a move that I will be fired up. Let me hear from you again. And it is a scary thought when your pattern of being fired up requires events. Don't you wish you could bring the worship team home with you? Do ta adol, pang pang pagsuga, pa effect. Wouldn't it be great if you could just say, "Pwede na mo suholon ang worship team sila AJ and Jera." You know, Jera, did you see Jera today? Yeah. All right. Wouldn't it be fantastic to just have them come and the whole team? Pastor, put this at a production para igtog namo tonight ba? Pang sa sugan na pay anana na pay haze. Yeah. Para my whole family is all fired up all the time. No, it's not done by people. The firing up part is you connecting to the Lord. And they did not. They took these miracles for granted. Which brings us to, why does human nature take miracles for granted? Did you know that where you are seated right now, you are a miracle? You couldn't know. Because you weren't here when an elderly lady by the name of Mami Tony, she's in Ormok now, she's bedridden, she needs a miracle herself, before every service before, would go chair to chair, and pray that God would fill the chairs with people. You are a miracle of her prayer. She actually prayed for each one. In fact, when we first stepped into the waterfront upstairs, we had half a ballroom. It scared us all. We said, okay, this is where we're going we're gonna to meet starting this Sunday. It was like, Man, this, is, this is huge. And Sheila was saying, Joe, do you think people will come? Um, I don't think there will be enough people who would want to listen to our worship team and to you doing this. I said, well, we, we need to pray. We need to pray. And God began to fill the room. 
And one day, we would just walk in, and it was a room full of people. I remember the first time it did get full. I said, wow, God is in the house. And it was like rejoicing. But then the next Sunday was full, and the next Sunday was full. And after a while, it was just like, oh, it's just another full Sunday service. We stopped appreciating God. But then more people would come and then become standing room. And God was telling us, open the dividing wall, get the next room. And I don't know what it was about me that I was scared to do that. I said, God, if we open this up, it's double the rent. It's double everything. And I don't know why I had the faith to fill one ballroom, but not the faith to fill both. Did you know that faith once used is no longer faith? That you need fresh faith for new miracles? Did you know that when Jesus healed people, there were various ways he healed them? Don't you think it would be enough to just say, be healed, and the blind man could see when he said it? And then he would touch, and the blind man could see. And then he would spit in the ground and, and make anointment and touch the man's eyes and tell the man to wash his face. Why wasn't it just one consistent way of doing things? I've come to realize this. Faith once used isn't faith anymore. It's like, oh, I've seen this now. I know how to do it. we got to stir ourselves up again and say, God, I'm going to step up to another level of believing and trusting. And so God began to fill the second room. And I was ecstatic with that. The the, the people were saying, wow, what a church. God's filling the church. Two big ballrooms now full of people. And it got so tight that we would walk by this room from upstairs and say, well, one day we will fill this. But, oh, can you imagine how much it costs? But cost always seemed to be the issue for people who lacked faith. Joe, you could believe for this, now believe for this. Now that you believe for this, can you believe for this? And you know what? There is no limit. God will provide. Amen? The limitation has always been us. Yeah, you like the God is provided part, but when he challenges your faith, I think you're sitting there and saying, hmm, I know where this is going. It's going to be towards the new center. Yes. Let's just be blunt about it. We need a new center. We're being kicked out of the old one in three months, in four months, and we need a new center. And God's going to use you and me to bless that place and build it. Amen. But it's really not about that. It's really about Why do we take God for granted? Why is it that when this old lady was going from chair to chair, praying, fill this with people, I would look and say, okay, let the old people do that. Yeah, I I thought it was a little bit weird. And now nobody prays for the chairs. The people just come. What an amazing prayer those people had. What made you come here? You didn't come to look at the worship team or some skinny man preach to you? Or is it bald man? You prefer bald? Yeah. Distinguishing feature. And yung pastor, katong opaw. But you came. And then you bring friends with you all the time. And your friends get a touch. And they go, ah, simbahan ni, ba naman concert, no? Cool. And so the church got filled with cool people. The person beside you does not like traditional church. The person beside you is cool. Yeah. Amen. Don't you like that? It's better than boring. And so as we see these prayers done, listen, listen to this. That we take miracles so for granted, we forget that where we are now is a miracle of somebody's prayer before. Who we are now is a miracle of what somebody had prayed for before. Where we are now was once the miracle we needed. If you've ever been sick and God heal me, heal me, please heal me, oh God, and God healed you, and now the next day or year after you're taking good health for granted, don't ever take for granted what God has done in your life. Where we are now was the miracle that we needed. Some of you needed provision, God provided it, and then afterwards you celebrated, then afterwards you complained again. I need another miracle. We are in the miracle that we needed, 
And then I need you to understand that you are the miracle of somebody's faith because they needed you saved. And all these three things that you are in it, you're part of it, where you are right now and who you are, the miracle of God, don't ever take that for granted. And this is where David writes, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And you're thinking, what does a stick have to do with comforting me? Now, a staff, you've seen a shepherd's staff, right? Skinny, stick, long, crooked at the top. Yeah. And, and the rod, a walking stick. It can act as a help for the shepherd as he's walking. It can also be like a cane. It can be a stick that he uses as a weapon. He's got a staff and a rod, and he says, they comfort me. I never understood the value of that until I met an old, old man who was formerly a rabbi, became a Christian. And he said, Pastor, he even said, young man, that was a long time ago, do you know why huh. David said his rod and his staff, they comfort me? And I said, yeah, because it helps him get the sheep into the, no, you don't, have you ever taken care of sheep? And I said, no, I've never taken care of sheep. And he said, how can you be a pastor if you've never been a shepherd? They're very philosophical people. They want to show that you are lower than them, smaller than them, that they are wiser than you. Have you met people like that? Yeah. If your spouse ever behaves like that, you say, stop being so Jewish. And uh, he said, look, this is why. The shepherd's job was so boring. He would sit on the side of the hill watching his flock and sheep are such boring animals. They have no excitement about them. All they do is they're not like goats that try to climb hills and rocky crags. Sheep just are safe people. Have you met safe, boring people? People, sakaita roller coaster. Why? Why? Mangamata palanta. No. It's calculated that it won't throw you off. Yeah. The scariest roller coaster in the world is not in Disneyland or some fa fun park. It's in Cubao, Manila. It's rusty. The braces are broken. The bolts don't, aren't in the ground anymore. And when the roller coaster turns, the whole railing tilts. That is scary, okay? Because you can really die. My point being, Every time a shepherd would take care of his sheep and something eventful would happen, he would take his little knife and mark it. Because sheep are uneventful beings. Okay? They're boring. Their color is white. There's no camouflage. It's not like, oh, there's a brown one. There's one. It's not like dogs. You have different colored dogs. Sheep are just sheep. They're like restrooms in the 1950s. It was all white. That was boring. Yeah? Hello? Sheep have dull hearing, dull, poor eyesight, dull sense of smell. Their bodies are fat. Their legs are short. They don't run fast. Okay. They can't defend themselves. They don't have fangs. When a wolf comes against them, you've never seen sheep fight back. You don't see sheep going <laughs> back, no matter how you corner the sheep. It just will not. All it does is they all huddle together because when they're afraid, they just come together closer. And without a shepherd, sheep are defenseless. So what is the defense of the sheep? They all come together. They try to get so close so that it's the out, outer sheep that get eaten. And hopefully, by that time, the wolf is already full, doesn't want to eat you anymore. Amen. They can't smell the predator. Even if the predator did smell, they can't smell. They can't dis determine what is poisonous grass from good grass. They can also, they have no vocabulary except ba for everything. When they're hungry, when they're tired, when they're weak, when they want to get married to each other, it's just one word all the time. It was a boring animal. And all they would do was just walk together. Now you've got to realize this. When sheep walk together, the front row sheep know where they're going. But the second row does not, because all they see is the back side of the front row. 
And a third row doesn't know either. So they're just, and if they wanted to stop, they can't because the sheep at the back get pushed them forward. And that's why they needed a shepherd because the shepherd can see further and say, Ui, it's a cliff. So the shepherd would actually lead his sheep first from the front. And when the alpha sheep follow, he goes to the back and he starts pulling the weak and the elderly and the straggling behind so that there's a momentum. But he keeps an eye because if the sheep in the front who doesn't have good eyesight realizes it's a cliff and says, warns the others, bah, it could mean many things. <laughs> Poor guy. What he actually meant was stop. But the guy in the second row doesn't see any, doesn't see the cliff because he just sees the backside. So he pushes the first row of sheep over the cliff and then realizes, ah, no wonder he said bah. And now it's his turn to say bah and it's too late. And the third row pushes him over. And that's why it's important to have a shepherd because shepherd can see further than that. And therefore, sheep are boring people. I mean, I'm sorry. As Christians, we are called sheep. And what David would do was one day a lion would come. He defended his flock and he tore the lion apart. And then a bear would come. He tore the bear apart. And each time God would bring him through a victory, he would mark his rod or his staff. And as he got older and older and older, there were more markings. He marked the miracles of God in his life because it is so easy to forget miracles. Get a manna and celebrate and then the next day complain again. So David's staff or a shepherd's staff would be full of markings. They were like the journal of a person. Once upon a time, Christians had journals. Get that habit again. Mark things. Don't just take pictures of notes. Mark it. Amen. And as he would mark it, it says there, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I want to tell you, it is scary to walk through a valley of the shadow of death. But when he looked at the staff, he saw, God saved me here. God empowered me here. God provided for me here. I had a miracle here. And it began to build up his faith. And it comforted him to know that God, who would never leave me or forsake me, will get me through this next trial. And that's why I'm not afraid, even though it's scary, to build another center that's going to cost us millions. Amen. And I'm reminded of what somebody said to me 13 years ago when we started this church. And we were both Cebuanos. We eat 800 peso dinners and we, tri we tip 20 pesos. Shame on uh, them. You want to bless waiters. You don't want to tip them. He said, you really want to build a church in Cebu with people that are stingy? I said, no, no it's going to be different because God's going to call and touch the people that aren't stingy. Amen. And the real miracle is not, we praise God, we got a new center. The real miracle is the person who never gave actually started to give. Knock God off his chair and let him go, wow, milagro ni hartag na gito. Thy rod and thy, thy staff, they comfort me. First time you came to City Church, I believe you actually went, wow, wow. If you were from Negros, and we got a whole lot of people from Negros, they walked in. I, I think they did that. I think every person that walked in, because it's the biggest one in, in, in the, one of the biggest ones in the country. When you walk in, it's like, wow, this is huge. And then we kept coming and coming and coming. And every time we came, it got smaller. Yeah. Our perspective got, got so big that this became small. Yeah. The building didn't get smaller. It was not like, nagkadugay ang building, nagkagamay. No, 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 no. The way we see things has changed. Perspective. And that's why when David spent so much time 
in the presence of such a big God, by the time he faced what everybody was afraid of, Goliath, the big man, the giant, everybody said, wow, have you seen this giant who has defied the armies of the living God? You know, he comes and he mocks God's, God's people and God. And David just looked at him. David did not say, he, he did not say it was big. He did not acknowledge the size of the person. You know why? Perspective. He got so used to bigness that Goliath wasn't big anymore. When you spend time worshiping a big, big God, what can man do to you when you face them? You actually say, ha, bosra na nako. Of course, you don't tell him that. But God can shake your boss. Kining boss sigig bugal bugal nako. Lord touch his life. Malay mo kita sa chag demonyo sa samin. Ugma mo repent po siya. Amen. Why are we trying to say this? Because the Old Testament that was full of miracles exhibited the power and love of God, but it also showed that in between miracles people did nothing such that they got so used to a miracle they needed another one and then another one and another one he did it for so long but it did not change people's hearts sometimes you think oh if only he could see an angel or if only a demon would show up he would ch change and he yeah he might initially do that did we not all have miracles of god in our lives did he not pay for bills that you were praying for? Did he not let you finally marry somebody that you... I mean, Sheila, for example, like, oh Lord, that she would marry me and say yes. And she did. What a miracle. And you wake up this next day and say, wow, she's still here. She didn't leave. And after 35 years, she's still around. That's a miracle. Why? Because, because she herself said, Joe, you are so hard to live with. And she stayed. That's a miracle she stayed. Uh -huh. And the feeling is mutual. <laughs> it's like, it's hard to live with somebody because, because you have to die to self. So why take your spouse for granted? And the person who takes his spouse for granted in Malachi showed you also must have taken God for granted. There are children in this room you have taken for granted the goodness of your parents. Uh, on behalf of your parents, thank you. Okay? If you've ever raised teenagers, you know what it feels like. You make all the sacrifices. Like there was a time they just consumed the pizza like anything. And there was one left, and I haven't even eaten yet. And they said, Dad, do you want your pizza? Dad, do you want your pizza? You know, as a father, I want the pizza. But because my sons wanted it, uh, hey yeah, guys, you can have it. <laughs> like piranhas that had not eaten. They'd all eaten between themselves seven slices, and there was one slice left for their skinny father was kind enough to say, you, you guys can have it. And they left. Ah, what may thank you, thank you. Parents have feelings. We write that on our rod as well. thank you, Maybe one rod has all the bad stuff and one rod has all the good stuff, huh? Why are we telling you this? Because after Malachi, it's good to say, oh, there was 400 years of silence, but then Jesus showed up. But you know when they had Jesus and he performed the miracles? What did they sh do shortly after that? Patyanasha, crucify him. The pattern doesn't change, does it? You were thinking, if only he would do a miracle to my son's life, my son will change. Perhaps. If only he would touch this person, that person would change. If only Jesus would show up, all Cebu would bow down at his feet. Wouldn't that be great? But it doesn't work that way. 
because it is only fueling our lustful desires for the supernatural experience. Like, wow, power. It is that lust for that experience that makes us seemingly alive for a while. And then we dry up again. And then we need another event and another event. And He can provide for you miraculously as He has 40 years like the manna. He could do that year after year after year. It is no guarantee that our hearts will respond in goodness. He died on the cross. We gave our lives and surrendered ourselves to Him. We wept at altars. Have you noticed all the weeping can sometimes be countered by just going back to your old life again? So what's the point of this whole meeting today? Could you please, not for a miraculous service, could you please go home and understand this? When people experienced their miracle and then dried up again and needed another miracle, it's because they never got intimate with the Lord. They would forget that God did something good and they become so dry that they would need a miracle again. And then they'd feel good again and then they'd go dry again. If only people would say, Lord, thank you for touching me. Now it's my turn. I want to touch you. I want to come back and spend time with you, not asking anything. I noticed that people in the Old Testament kept forgetting the God of miracles. And you've got to realize this. You only forget the good things people have done if they're not intimate with you. But if you're intimate with somebody, you never forget. Because intimacy necessitates constant thought. When you're intimate with somebody, you're always thinking about them, appreciating them. And I think what has happened is they fell in love with the miracles that God would work. And so He is a miracle working God, but they never seem to respond long enough in time to consistently developing a heart to love God again. They just wanted another miracle. What can we do as a people today? It's June. Level up. Go home. Tonight, if you don't have a need, praise God you don't have a need. But understand this, waking up tomorrow is a miracle. Going through your day is a miracle. The job that you are in right now with all the complaints you have against it was once upon a time a prayer, oh God, that I could get that job. And then you got into it and you celebrated, then you took it for granted and you stopped appreciating God for miracles. You got out of a boring, dead church and you search, God, show us a church that is alive where the people are excited and they really love you. You stepped into this place and you went, wow, this is a miracle that there are enough people that are actually in love with God. And you came, you immersed yourself, and after a while, you took it for granted. And he says, oh, no, I've got to go to church again. I'm tired. Can we try another church, Dad? No. It's the complacency that we have in not being consistent in appreciating God. That's why they would dry up. I'll read to you a, a psalm before you leave today. Psalm 103. Make this your homework for the week. But what a fantastic psalm. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. The word bless means to make happy. God blesses you, but it says here that you bless God. You're used to God blessing you. It's time for us to bless God. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me in verse 2. He says, forget not all His benefits. Look what He has done for us who forgives, in verse 3, all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction. Grab the verbs when you read the Bible. Forgives, heals, redeems. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. That's food. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. 
satisfies, renews. Verse 6, the Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are op oppressed. He has made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He shall not he has not dealt with us according to our sins. Oh, that's good news. Nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are, as, are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear Him. So, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. And, it's, and, for, and for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place is remembered no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children to such as keep His covenant and to those who remember His commandments to do them. You finish the verse, the, the, the psalm when you go home. Go home, read that tonight. Wake up tomorrow, read it again. This whole assembly today was not just about how good God is in our lives. He is constantly good. It's how do we behave in between the last miracle to the next. Instead of complaining, Ah God, unsa omani, papahawa unta sa center, mangita na sa kwarta for a new one. Look, have we not enough markings in our staff to comfort ourselves and say, Kadaghan nag milagro gihimong ginoo. So why am I worrisome about my current condition? I can say, God has brought me through so many trials. We've climbed over so many mountains. We've jumped over so many chasms. Every trial, He has always seen me through. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And this thing that we call a challenge will one day just be another answered prayer that we can mark the rod and say, God has just brought us to another level. So when you meet your Goliath this month, just say, you're not big. You should see my God. He's big. And He has brought me through all the trials. I killed a lion. I killed a bear. And I'm going to kill this next challenge as well. And it comforts my soul to know, no matter how big this challenge can be, God is on our side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Father, thank you so much for you're a God who never leaves nor forsakes. There's people in this room today, the trial they're going through appears to be so big. They've magnified the trial. But they're going to go home tonight and magnify you till you become so big in their lives and their trials look so pathetically weak and small. There's some people in this room, the giant they're facing is not outside, it's in their hearts. Dryness, weakness, discouragement, hurt, disappointment. I pray that they would come before you today and fill their hearts with so much of you that as their hearts are filled, they would become alive again. I pray every person is in this room that is facing something big, has God not convinced you enough that He has been faithful through the, through the trials of your past? And He is a God who changes not. And therefore, He will see you through every trial that you face. For He always provides a way of escape. In Jesus' name, walk out of this room bigger than before you walked in. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise God.